Good morning and welcome back. I just want to start this video by saying I am stunned and humbled and remotely shocked by the outpouring of love that my first video received. I'm going to do my best to already make some improvements. There have been so many suggestions and positive comments. I have so much more to share. I feel as though I'll never be able to do enough videos or I, I just can't describe how grateful I am that I'm able to share with all of you. So I want to say thank you for, for real. I want to send a special shout out to Tanya Thompson at My Jewelry Addiction. Tanya, I sure hope it's okay that I mentioned you in this. I didn't ask, but I feel like I owe you a very big thank you for everything that you've been willing to give to me. Um, you have been a fantastic friend. Um, I met Tanya a little bit over a year ago on YouTube. I was new to all of it. I had sent her a message because there was a bracelet on her live that I wanted to buy. And I didn't know how the YouTube thing worked. And I didn't know the rules and regulations. And I didn't know how it all happened. And I sent her a message and I told her to call me and she was fair warned not to call me because, you know, stranger danger. Um, but Tanya called me because she's courageous and the most real person you'll ever meet. And she um, graciously sold me the bracelet and we started this incredible friendship. And here we are today uh, sharing a beautiful beautiful friendship. Um, and I'm just so incredibly grateful. I don't want to, you know, really give anyone a certain shout out. But Tanya is definitely the reason why I decided to start YouTube. And I'm so thankful. So grateful. Um, I left out quite a bit in my first video that I really felt was important to define me as not only a person and an artist, but a true collector at heart. Uh, the things that I show are things that I personally live with. They're not out of a book or images offline. I live with these things. I love them very much. And it has been a labor of love to create many of these collections. I thought that I had left out many important things on my collections in the first video. I have had this great affection not only for jewelry what I consider tiny and shiny, but I have had this affection for anything unusual, historical, something that I considered important. I never based my collections on the value that other people put on things. I looked at the way things were constructed. I studied them and their importance and their past lives. And that's where I feel that I differ from people. It doesn't make me better. It just makes me different. Uh, my approach has been innate inside of me. It wasn't really something that was given to me by somebody else. Um, I don't stop at anything for my collections. Um, I go from paintings and prints to etchings, uh, which were focused mainly on landscapes and portraits of animals. I then started to fall in love with art pottery, uh, slightly more commercial, if you will. Uh, companies like Fulper, Roseville, Weller. But then I got into the more artisan-created European things, which I'll eventually show if that's something that you all want to see. I'd be more than willing to do that. I then moved on to art glass, and I didn't really stop at anything there. I was very much so seduced by color and form. I went from antique to contemporary. I focused on turn-of-the-century items, such as Lotz and Bohemian art glass, from around 1900 to 1915. I started to lose interest once things were taken over by the Industrial Age, which, of course, I would like to discuss in future videos. I also loved Venetian and Murano, including Seguso, Sommerso, Vanini, Barbini, other makers that were highly prolific, but their forms and their technique were unrivaled. 
A favorite of mine in terms of art glass was Orient and Flume paperweights. Um, And that is correct. It's Flume, F-L-U-M-E. I got out of control with them. I will show you one at the end of this video and you'll see why I love them very much. And now I have over a hundred of them. I've just gotten completely out of control. And once you start to collect something, you are immersed in it. Um, And it's a very passionate thing, a very emotional thing. At least for me, it is. I love early boxes and trunks. I really love antique jewelry boxes. I started collecting them as early as 16 or 17. I have over 100 celluloid ring boxes, the really beautiful celluloid boxes from... They started around the 1915, 1918 time period and were made through the 1940s. I can show you some of those eventually. Ladies Fashion also had me um, incredibly refocused. I could go on and on and on of the things that spoke to me and the things that made me happy and brought me joy. I really stayed focused on jewelry for the vast majority of my collecting from the time I started. And I feel like this time around, maybe I'd already been here several times. There had been times when I would find something and it felt like I was already familiar with it with no explanation. Uh, Today, I wanted to stay focused on, again, jewelry just because it would be easiest for me. My stick pin collection, which you're looking at in the camera, is so varied, just like many of my other collections. I look at form. I look at material. I didn't really stay focused on a specific. In the center of this tray is a brooch that I would like to do a separate video on. Um, It's from the late 1600s, early 1700s, and it's from the Iberian Peninsula. It is gold and table cut rubies um, and an extremely large and complex version. And again, I would like to be able to take it off of the board and talk about it by itself. This board is one of 16. I, um, again, when I get into something, I truly get into it. These pins varied from as low as 25 cents and 50 cents to several hundred dollars. Just a few on this board that are standouts. Uh, There's a mixture of materials, but a few of the standouts is this ancient Egyptian scarab. It's in fact ancient Egyptian and mounted in 18 karat gold. Then we have this tiny, tiny pin, uh, 14 karat white gold, a synthetic blue sapphire, but a natural pearl, not cultured, but totally natural. And I'll get into specifics on stones and how they're created. Um, by Mother Nature in future videos. And then just a quick run through this board. There's a boulder opal diamond carved cameo from around 1910, a Mississippi pearl out of the Mississippi River mounted in 18 karat gold. I wish I could get closer on some of these. Here is a absolutely beautiful fire opal that was carved as a cameo. And we know that most Opals are not carved like this because they are so soft, but look at the fire inside of that stone. And just on and on and on, uh, one of my major ones was um, natural gold nuggets, and this one is a natural gold nugget with quartz inclusion. Um, Just a beautiful thing. Another natural pearl, uh, platinum and diamond on that one. A fire opal, this is Tiffany and Company from around 1908 to 1910. This one really had me fascinated. Someone had found an Indian artifact and had wanted it mounted in 14 karat gold at the turn of the century, the last century, that is, in the 1900s. Again, the dust on the board, it's a velvet board, and you'll just have to forgive the fact that um, I I cleaned it three times and it's still dirty, but again, it is what it is. I'm not going to apologize. There's a um, front view enameled bulldog. This is in 14 karat gold, um, and it is fully enameled. Um, Just on and on and on. And then I'll go into the second tray that I pulled of the collection, just because, again, I 
love to keep these safe. I love to keep them displayed so that I can look at them. And they do go to my presentations when I do actual presentations. And I'll get into some of the talks that I do on the local level and also the national level. Um, you have a front view lion here on this side. Sorry, I have to turn this. Uh, this is ruby and diamond in 14 karat gold, bohemian garnet, a synthetic sapphire again, an enameled St. George slaying the dragon, a griffin in 14 karat gold. And look at this dog. Look at that face. Uh, I just absolutely had to have it. Um, it was a must when I saw it. The front view um, aviator with his glasses, which are rhinestone eyes, and a front view cat, of course. How could I leave a cat out, right? Those are also glass eyes. They're not gemstones. A billikin, this little guy right here is a good luck billikin, sterling silver. And all of these are mounted on stick pins. So all of these are, in fact, stick pins. This one in the center, I found her at an antique show and again fell in love. Um, she is 14 karat gold and enamel just really beautifully done. Um, again, it just on and on and on. This pug stole my heart. It's a front view pug dog, little rhinestone eyes, and just a beautiful fellow. Um, angel skin coral in a claw, a sword, a saber, another perfect example of coral, a tiny little amethyst cabochon, aquamarine, platinum, and diamond, Art Deco, very streamlined, very bold, natural calibre cut sapphires and a European cut diamond in the center. A griffin, an opal, a citrine, just on and on and on. This one, it's Meiji period, Japanese. It is silver and it has little gold feet. Again, the craft on it is just incredible. These were produced by gentlemen that had made samurai swords that had... Um, been basically put out of business when they weren't needed anymore, and they turned into making jewelry. I've yet to find another stick pin that was made like that. Tokens or love tokens that were coins at the Victorian times turned into stick pins or wearable jewelry. And then this one in the center, this is also Tiffany and Company. It is in fact a genuine opal. It is considered a specimen brooch and just remarkable in terms of gemstone color and size. Just just a, a small sampling again of the greater collection that is in my holdings. And the last board that I pulled because I figured I could talk about each pin for probably an hour. Um, this one was one of my favorite trays. And uh, again, it ranges from Victorian through the 1930s. So approximately the earliest one on here would be about 1860 to 1870. And then the latest would be right around 1920, 1930. But some of my favorites, and um, we have one of the most rare, when people see these, they think they're in fact, emerald and diamond, but they're not. They're demantoid garnet or demantoid, however you wish to pronounce it, both are correct. A platinum body, and the little tiny green garnets inset inside of this good luck turtle. Um, again, right around 1910, 1915, and onto this snake. It's pilated gold, it's woven, and then soldered together with, again, um, transitional cut diamond eyes. And transitional cut stones um, will be discussed in future videos. These are mine cut diamonds, and um, some may say they're rose cut, but they're not quite rose cut. They're close, but they don't have the six even facets to make a rose cut stone. So those are more mine cut, if you will. This is a fire opal in 18 karat gold, insects and mixed metals. This one is turn of the century, gold and silver to create the effect. We have another St. George slaying the dragon, and this one is on a broke pearl. Another natural gold nugget that is supposed to be from the Alaska Gold Rush. I don't have proof that it is or is not because there were other um, mining places, obviously, throughout the world and throughout history. We have a carved hardstone cameo, some more garnets, 
And this was one of my favorites. It's a natural coral dog that is seated on the top of the pin, and the rest of the pin is 14 karat gold right at the turn of the century on that one. So you can kind of see my affection for certain materials and certain designs and certain aesthetics. This one came in just yesterday, so it didn't make the board, but it is in fact butterfly wing underneath 14 karat gold. It is clearly marked on the back, and it has a tiny little seed pearl at the bottom, but it is butterfly wing underneath glass, and that butterfly that you see is an actual butterfly, and the butterfly wing behind is from the blue morpho butterfly, and there is a rich history of them gathering the butterflies and using them in jewelry. And again, just a stick pin. But um, a beautiful thing. And again, we'll probably start the 17th board <laughs> of stick pins. I also wanted to include something that is not a stick pin. But when I get into decorative arts, this was sitting on my table right next to me. So I thought, what, a, what another thing to talk about. This box came to me from an antique shop located in Peninsula. And um, it was just absolutely incredible. I knew that it was really well crafted and I thought it could be Tiffany and Company. And sure enough, I flipped it over when I was there and it's clearly marked on the back of it. It's Tiffany Studios, New York. And then the 1176 is the, the um, design number for the box, a natural patination across the surface. So no one had ever polished this or refinished this, which I loved the original patination and what a beautiful box, inlaid abalone shell. And there is a secret about this box. I did replace one of the shells and I showed it to a dealer and they could not figure out which one I replaced. So I do some restorations from time to time. It may take me several hours, but it's a labor of love and I will be glad to do it. On the inside of the box, I wasn't going to show this, but I decided I'm going to show this. Um, I hunted Indian artifacts for a small while, and um, I did it during COVID and during the restrictions. And this was my first one I ever found. I found it in Rittman, Ohio. Um, I, I could talk about this for a whole video, and I very well might. It was um, a childhood dream of mine to find Indian artifacts and arrowheads. And this is only worth about $3 on the open market. It's woodland. Um, but to me, it's worth a million dollars. It was a remarkable feeling to pick this up in a field after the last person that had touched it was over, you know, a thousand years ago. This was one of my more major accomplishments, even though to advanced collectors, it really wouldn't much matter. Um, this was found in Summit County, Ohio, and it was found near an old ancient waterway. So it had been in water for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. This is an archaic blade, which would be approximately 8,000 to 9,000 years old. And to think that this item was used to keep someone alive and was made by hand. And again, the last person that had touched this before me was thousands of years ago. It brought me back to a sense that um, our people that lived before us are definitely still part of us. Um, have no further explanation for that, but this is one of my favorite uh, artifacts that I have found. I just feel so thankful and so grateful that I was able to find that. And there's other ones in the box that I had found. And, you know, I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. I keep notes of where I find them just because I want to make sure that if I pass or, well, I should say when I pass, because I'm not going to live forever. Maybe I will live forever. Who knows? Um, I want to make sure that the next generations know the origin of where these sacred Indian artifacts come from. Because the response was so great on items that I have crafted and created, I decided to grab this ring off my dining room table. I have never shown it. I have only worn it a few times. This was my third ring I ever made in school. 
I crafted it out of sterling silver. The band is um, basically melted or um, the, the fine silver was raised to the surface with torch. And then I rolled it and soldered it on the inside. And you can see as a novice, my solder seams were a bit rough. I, I don't have any apology for it because I was so young at doing this. The stones are fire agates. They're from the Slaughter Mountain Mine. And you can Google a ton of information on the Slaughter Mountain Mine. They are fire agate. And of course, my last stone that I set, the very last one, I cracked it when I was setting it. And I learned a valuable lesson not to use a certain hammer and to go very, very slow. Again, the mounting is sterling silver, completely hand fabricated by me. And it is just a, a very special thing to me because I had crafted it so long ago. And I have come so far, but it was a reminder of where I started. And I just think it's beautiful. Once it's on, I took my other ring off. Once it's on, it is it's so wearable, although so bold and so big. But again, I'm that kind of person. Uh, too much is just enough, I guess. <laughs> um, like Carmen Miranda, too much fruit is just enough. <laughs> so there's that ring. And then this is another one that I had on today. It was my ring of choice because it's fall here and the fall colors. It's a beautiful stone, completely handcrafted in sterling silver. And I was taught in school that the back had to be as beautiful as the front. So there are a lot of times in my work, um, hidden things on the back of the items. And this is a little sterling silver ingot. I just felt that it mimicked the design here. So I soldered a little tiny, a little tiny planet, um, if you will, on that one. So um, I'm a very staunch person when it comes to craft. And when it comes to bezels, they better fit a stone right. <laughs> That's all I can say. So there's that one. And then um, this one, of course, you know, I really like to blend in everywhere I go. <laughs> it's my full time job to blend in. Um, that is total sarcasm, by the way. Uh, this is lapis. It is gem grade lapis, not treated in any way. So you will see some white and you will see the metallic um, deposits in the stone. And then the rest of the stones are diamonds. And then the chevron and um, bezel set zigzag is um, genuine sapphire. This ring was made in India. It was brought into an international gem show and I fell in love with it. Um, had to think about it for a couple of days and then it ate at me that it was something that I would really love to have. So I bought it. Um, in conclusion, I'm trying to make this a little shorter than my first one. Um, this is the Orient and Flume paperweight that I was discussing earlier. Um, it is just one of an example of the hundred that I own. Orient and Flume craft design colors are just truly exceptional. They are always mostly signed on the bottom, Orient and Flume there. You will see the signature. And then most of the time have an inventory identification, sometimes an artist signature before that, and then customarily a date. And this one's from 1977. And the, the attraction to this is I'm running out of space. And so they're tiny and they're beautiful, well-crafted. The colors are, are just truly works of incredible miniature art. And since I didn't take glass in school, I have had this more major affection for it later in life. Um, and if you would like to see more Orient and Flume paperweights, all you have to do is ask and I'll be glad to do a short video on that. The final piece for today is a Lotz Titania vase. This is from 19, right around 1905 to 1907. Um, it is blue on the inside, an electric, 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 beautiful blue. And then on the outside is this mottled, vibrant, in indescribable, heavenly, green, mottled green, metallic swirl into a light blue at the top. And then an artist so carefully deposited solid sterling silver on the surface of the vase. And I'll move it back so you can get the whole thing and the whole view. It's decorated 360 degrees. There isn't a single area on this vase that isn't beautiful. So again, there's the bottom. So you can see Lotz Art Glass. That's L-O-E-T-Z. 
Um, again, one of my several current affections and something that I'm currently completely driven crazy by and seduced by. That is it for this video. I am so glad that you were willing to come back. Again, please like and subscribe and send me out to all of your other friends if you would. I'm trying to get some traction and I look forward to seeing you in the next video once I get my ring light and my tripod, which are definitely a necessity. I will most certainly go camera up so you can see this handsome face. I love you all so much. Have a wonderful day. Take good care. Bye-bye.